I thought, I thought Wednesday night was a really, I left here a really encouraged Wednesday night. I really believe that it's, it's an important time if we can invest in it and make it important. I mean, you know, and I don't want to put any kind of try on it. I don't want to try to do this or try to do that or try to do the other. I know this, if we will come prepared and yielded to the Holy Spirit, and yielded to one another with a purpose of wanting to give, what will happen is somebody will make a draw off of you. Somebody, it'll be here, and you'll, you'll be in that place, and you'll be able to release that. Because, listen, a lot of people are stopped up. A lot of people, because they quit giving, because maybe somebody didn't receive it, they didn't like it, they disagree with it, they want to argue, or they just don't care, all, all the above things. When we stop being givers, we stop being receivers. And you're just dead in your tracks. And so I thought Wednesday night was, was good. And I think what we're trying to accomplish is continuing to do what Yahweh calls us to do. And in these 50 days of counting the Omer, that Yahweh is reestablishing in us his character. He's reestablishing us his purpose and his ways. He's revitalizing us. That's what he always does. And I thank him for that. I want to, uh, uh, because of that, and under that, while we're, while we're talking about it, I want to I preach a message this morning that I believe is straight out of the heart of God. And I believe that when I preach it that you will be able to receive that message in your heart and in your mind and apply it to yourself. And I think it's going to be beneficial to you. I'm praying, and I've prayed for you already, that this is going to be something that's going to encourage all of us. Because I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm speaking to everybody. You understand that? And so I'm so, I'm so glad that uh, uh, you're here. Corey, I'm glad you're back today. I heard this week was a good week for you. Amen. Amazing week, man. See, man, you, get God, you put God first, man. He, he plows the way for you. Man, I heard you got a job. You got, I mean, you, got, you left here with some cash in your pocket, didn't you? I mean, hey, yeah, we love you, man. We love you. Now, dig in. Let's go. Now, I want to talk to us today about one of my favorite people in the Bible. And I have all these reasons why. It's not just because of the stories, but I have some personal reasons why this man, Elijah, is important to me. Matter of fact, we've talked a lot about Elijah and Elisha and the ways of God and how Elisha had to follow Elijah. We call it the, the, uh, the, uh, you must, uh, the, the fatherhood principle, basically it's what it is. It's responsible to and, not, and, and responsible for. And so it's a, it's a matter of when we're walking in the spirit and we're walking in the economy of God and the government of God, you have to follow somebody. I have people tell me, I'm going to follow Jesus. Well, number one, you ain't going to follow him if you don't know his name. Maybe just put that in there. But the fact is, you, you can't separate your relationship with God from the body of Christ. You can't do it. Because the body of Christ will put a demand on us to view ourselves, and they will, they will sharpen your iron harder than anybody else. Because you're stuck with them. It's like being married. You know what I'm saying? When God joins you to somebody, you're stuck with them. So you have to work it out. And working it out means that you learn a lot about yourself. That's what the Bible says. And that's also been my experience. So I love the book of Kings. I love the book of Kings, man. You know, we're talking about kingdoms and kings and the kingdom, uh, the, the gospel of the kingdom. And I want to name this message this. I was going to name it Visions of Grand Manure. And I thought maybe somebody would like that because, you know, here, here Elijah is, the ravens are feeding him. And I don't know about you, but whenever birds light in a tree and land in a tree, they leave their droppings. So here we are. We have all these visions of grand manure of what we think God is and how it's going to work out and what our life is going to be like. We have all those things only to find out what life really is. It's nothing but a great big groundhog day. I love that song. The wheel in the sky keeps on turning because you get up in the every, every day. Same thing. Same thing. Life is monotonous. That's why people are so busy trying to break the routine of the monotony of it. But I want to talk. I've decided to name this. Struggles of a champion. 
The struggles of a champion. One of the shows I like on TV is ESPN 30 for 30. Is it 32, 30 for 30? What? Yeah, well, you'll know what I'm talking about. And it shows the lives of all these people. And, and you know, these guys, you, you always, we have this perception of what we, who we think people are. But this book of Kings, I want to tell you, gives us an insight into the struggles of a mighty, mighty champion. Man, this Elijah dude was bad to the K-tail bone. Nobody believes that and understands that anymore. Okay, sorry. This high mountaintop that he was on called Mount Carmel. We see this man named Elijah, and he's at his brilliant best. He's at the top of his game. I mean, he is at the top of the mountain. He won a claim. He got fame. He got a reputation that he was a champion, a winner. I loved him as a young man. Who he was and how, what things he did for God were celebrated. And he defeated all of his adversaries, it appeared. But not far long after that, if you keep reading... After a great victory that he had over the prophets of Baal, calling fire down from heaven, being a little smart aleck about it. I mean, so arrogant almost. Not, maybe he wasn't arrogant. Maybe he's just confident with faith in him. But he was saying, hey, where's your God? Is he on vacation? Maybe he's in the bathroom. He literally said that. All right, now let's make it hard on my God. You know the story. He called fire down from heaven. All the 450 prophets of Baal were killed. But this is what I learned about Elijah, and I want you to relate it to yourself. Is that the accolades and the miracles that he did on top of the mountain are a lot easier to handle and to accomplish than avoiding a juniper tree. I've been in places in my life where I've sang and preached in really big churches. I've received really big offerings. I've received people clapping and standing and patting me on the back and telling me how good I was and how great it was and prophesying over me all these kind of things only to find out that the other side of that mountain is a slippery slope to the grave. And my desire to go to the top of the mountain, I thought was going to be there, but I found out that my enemies weren't the prophets of Baal necessarily. I found out the number one enemy, number one, we've talked about it for years and we've tried to teach people the truth, was me. My internal dialogue, my perspective. After all of this powerful victorious victory that dude was under a tree depressed he met his humanity he had to deal with the fact of whether he really believed in something that he couldn't see that didn't make sense and wasn't logical to his fallen shriveled human brain who think, you know, he, he, like the rest of us, think, well, I tell you what, that's, that's the way I see it. That's the way I look at it. That's the way I believed it. That's the way I, I, to find out what's he really believed. And what about all these enemies that we've been talking about? Number one, the one of fear. Enemies created from his Previous victory even. Watch this. You come to a great place in your life of victory, and the very victory is what gave him the fear he had because his life was threatened. He said, okay, you did that. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to kill you. We're going to do you. Jezebel said, you're going to die the same way you killed them. So his victory was the thing that created his enemy. Can you hear what I'm saying? One of the greatest things that ever happened to me is to know the true gospel. Guess what that did? 
It made everybody think I'm crazy. Here I was, I thought I did something good and had something great to tell the world and most of the world now. So the very thing that I thought was an accomplishment caused a lot of my problems. Are y'all hearing me today? This old boy's depression was so bad. And I'm going to call it depression. You can call it whatever you want to. When I'm depressed, I call it depression. His depression was so bad, man. He just got finished winning the Super Bowl. He didn't go to Disney World. He went to his own place. And his depression was so bad that this is what he said. He prayed that he would die. I'm like, there could be a book in the Bible about me. I can so relate to this person who can have the best times and the worst times within a very short time period. Matter of fact, get up in the morning happy. Before you, before you go to bed at night, you're all sad. Wore out. Mentally, de mentally defeated. I know this don't apply to anybody here, but just let me talk about myself a little bit. Me and Elijah, okay? I found out in my life, kind of like Elijah, it can happen at the same time. Happy, not happy. No reason not to be happy, but I'm not. No reason to be sad, but I'm sad. Happy, but sad. Oh, my God. Some people say you're bipolar. Some people say you're manic depressed. I don't care what label you put on it. I'm telling you that Elijah, the, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived, probably the greatest prophet, that was the prophet that represented all prophets, and he was the type in the shadow of Christ himself, who was prophet, priest, and king. Prophet Elijah, priest, Moses, King David. He's a pretty, pretty big guy in the Bible. He's in the top three, excluding Yahshua himself, and he was a type in the shadow of that part of Yahshua. But I want you to look at what kind of person he was mentally. Man. It's like this. I, I know people that have, man, they love their jobs, but their, but their home life is horrible. Or they hate their jobs, but their home life's wonderful. We all have this Mount Carmel ex experience, you know, and we've won the awards and we've been given accolades and, you know, maybe you're celebrated about being the best at this or the best at that or the best this and the nicest this and the most loving of this. But I guarantee you, I haven't met a person yet that doesn't have a place where they go and isolate themselves So they can express their fears and anxieties. And I want to tell you what I have found out. It's the loneliest place I've ever been. And it don't matter who tells you they love you. They can tell you they love you. They can buy you stuff. They can do everything for you. But it's irrelevant because in our hearts we're in this lonely place. We are broken. We're fatigued. We're tired of what? Really, try and do this all in your own power. Because you're right back to where you were before you got to where you were, where you are. Well, I can do this, I can do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I found this, I ain't going to do nothing except what I'm empowered by God to do. And I'm not going to do anything that I'll tell anybody something that I'm going to do except, by, the Bible says, by the grace of God, if the Lord willing... Because in my own ability, I do not have the power to do what God has called me to do or be the man God's called me to be or to love the people that he's called me to love no matter how hard I try. It ain't going to work without the power of God's Holy Spirit in you and the Word of God and the man of God. Boom, there it is. It gave me hope. 
want to tell you something. I remember when we built this building. It was such a happy time, man. Y'all remember? Remember we got this big steel beam here. We had a special made steel beam. We thought we were special. Here we're building this building. We're rejoicing. Come to church on Sundays and then pray. Or, or, you know, when it first we got, before it got built, we were going to church. And, man, we're all excited. We couldn't wait. We had all this stuff here. People came here, worked together and all this. But little did many people know that they, they pushed all that dirt over there, over next to where the water retention is now, pond is. And there's any day you could have driven by. And if you pulled around that hill of dirt, you just seen my car there and I was expressing my anxiety and my fears you could have seen it expressed in a car a grown man over there crying like a little girl crying out to God when I should have been all excited and all that and I was but that car parked there was a manifestation of what I'm trying to talk to you about today I've seen people who I know their pillow at night is a wet pillow of being tearful, crying. And people say, well, I, don't, I ain't going to cry. Well, there's all kinds of ways of crying. It might do you good to let some tears come out. It does me. People go to that bar, man, they hit that those drugs, they hit that alcohol to mask those inner feelings. Let me tell you what my boy Elijah did at the top of his game. Call of God. I'm talking about way before me. Way before anything I even think I could ever be. Nothingness of me. This was Elijah. He said, I've had enough. Please take my life. I want to die. It's a place where an encourager can become discouraged. Don't you listen close to me. I'm going to apply it to you. I don't want you to look at me and say, man, you're a big baby. No, I want you to look at you, okay? It's a place where people who are strong feel weak. Look, I can be strong about one thing, but I can be weak when I'm trying to do the things that God requires me to do. Oh, I'm strong about this. I can preach the gospel and tell what the Word says and do all that. But what about loving that unlovely person over there that owes me money, that stabbed me in the back, and t t tells people bad things, sows seeds of discord among the brethren, I feel weak about that. I feel weak about stepping out in faith. Well, I want you to give this, Johnny. I want you to put that money in there. I want you to do that. I'm strong about this. Whoa, whoa wait a minute now. Now I'll get weak. The, the encourager, the strong, becomes weak and becomes discouraged. Under that place is a place where I've learned to make it place of rest a place of getting wise counsel a place where a new perspective emerges every time it's a place of sorrow despair but Yahweh always turns it to a place of refreshing restoration reinvention recalibrating it's like a new thing. Okay, now oh, I've got a second win here. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, now. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Waiting on the Lord isn't. It's serving. It's doing what you're supposed to do whether you don't feel like it or not. It's like being married and having a job or anything else. get this new energy and this motivation it produces accelerated an acceleration of things in my heart and it gives me a new vision and an improvement in outcomes because I've been to this place and yet God raises me up just like he did the first time 
And then he takes me, I'm there again, he raises me up again. And pretty soon he makes those low places and those high places like this. The Bible says, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself what a, what went a day's journey. This is, uh, I believe it's Ezekiel 18. Might be 19. I believe it's 19. But he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, it's, which call, it's really called a broom tree, a broom bush. I was going to use that, you know, sweep away your sadness. That would have been a good title, right? And he requested for himself that he might die. He said, it's enough now, Lord, take my life. Listen to what he said. Listen, for I am not better than my father's. I ain't no better than my daddy was, really. Look at me. I'm, what's changed about me? I'm not changed. I do something for God, but look, here I am inside in my mind and all this. I ain't no better than my daddy was. said, if thou faint in the day of adversity, the Bible says, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Because you're going to have adversity, man. Y'all hear me? You're going to be attacked, and you're going to, be, you're going to have all these things that's going to make you want to quit. It's going to discourage you. You're going to get your eyes on other people. You're going to get it on your circumstances. You're going to say, I can't do that. That's too much. Even after you've already done it before. But now you're done. Now you're back down there saying, just look. Until this time, man, Elijah was a bad mamma jamma. He had this magnificent courage in the face of tremendous odds, man. One to 450? That's pretty a bad dude right there if you ask me. But the problem is, I mean, the difference was, during that time, he had his eyes upon Yahweh, and he had his eyes upon Yahweh's promises, not what this looked like or that looked like or that would happen or this is happening. I'm going to tell you what. Remarkable, miraculous answers to prayer followed the faithfulness of this man who kept his eyes on Yahweh and not his circumstances. He didn't walk there, whoa, wait, whoa, wait, there's 450 guys. And listen, y'all. They didn't, they didn't have problems like, my washing machine broke. They didn't have that kind of problems. They were going to kill him. Y'all hear me? It'd be like Trump putting out a hit on you. All right, hey, Underwood, I'm going to get you. Now, how many of you want to, the FBI, well, they probably would flub it up, but besides, you know. Who wants to hit on you by somebody that's the, the president or the king of the whole country? When he went against those prophets of Baal, I'm going to tell you what. He put a hurting on them. He put a hurting on the belief system. Three and a half years of drought because God was chastening Israel. For they're worshiping another God. You hear what I just said? When you worship other gods, drought's coming. Just, I just want to throw that in there. The prosperity of the world and of their system that was led by Ahab and his evil queen Jezebel. Things weren't going so good. They weren't having a prosperous year. 450 of those false prophets of this idol that they worship would no longer speak anymore and preach their gospel. And they were done. But this thing that was the true enemy of this man and of all humans absolutely was not willing and showed no inclination whatsoever to roll over and just die. I wish I could kill my enemies like he did the prophets of Baal. And shut up my internal dialogue like Elijah did. Just call fire down on it. But if it does, it's going to mess up my hair. Jezebel was as stubborn as ever. And Elijah made this mistake. And I want you to listen to me. He made this mistake. 
And this is a mistake that I've seen has proven fatal to many people who, who start their journey. The Bible says, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. Let me tell you what. When you look at the wrong thing and you act on that or react to that, you're in trouble. You've been doing so good. you got your eyes on Yahweh, what he says. I know it don't mean it, it, don't, it does not compute to our logic and reasoning. But the fact is, you do it Yahweh's way. And I'll tell you what, like I said earlier today, he delivered me from every single thing that's come into my life. And there's going to be bad things that's going to happen to everybody. Some of you are sitting here with no mothers who've passed away. You know what? Everybody's mother's going to pass away eventually. You understand that? Life isn't just this happy thing. You know, that, that's what everybody thinks. Like King David. Let me tell you what David did. He looked at the wrong thing too. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When he looked over and saw the maiden bathing, it caused him to act a certain way. Think and act a certain way. Not only did he lust in his heart and have adulter committed adultery, he had her faithful, not only to her, but to David, who wouldn't even go home from battle to be laid with his wife because he was going to be laid at David's doorstep to protect him. He had him killed because of what he saw and acted on it. When he saw and heard that and heard, oh, man, Jezebel's going to get you. She's going to get you. Look, you just called fire down from heaven. And you were as, as arrogant and, and confident as you could say. But all of a sudden, now one woman says something. Oh, and you run. And now you're tired. You just defeated 450. How is one more woman going to get you tired? I'll tell you why. Because you've got your eyes now on that. You're focused on that. And it, you've magnified that. The Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Didn't we sing that this morning? You may tell you what that means. You make God bigger than what your circumstances are. You magnify him. You can't magnify him as big as he is because he is bigger than everything. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But you have to magnify him. No, I'm, no. I'm going to make what God says. I'm going to look at what God says. Taking a long, if he'd taken a long, hard look at Jezebel and her threats before, he would never have taken the steps of obedience and faith in God that he had followed for over three and a half years. Jezebel was still there. Jezebel was still running her mouth. She was still threatening. She was doing all those kind of things. But you know what he did? He didn't lose his focus off of believing what God said and who God was. Even though her threats was real, he didn't give any credit to it or value to it. He did not respect her threats. He respected the word of God. He was unmindful of himself. He didn't really worry about his his own personal safety because he believed he was hidden in God, hidden in Yahweh. And so what he did, he did what God said. And if the worst thing could happen to him was die, he knew that the next thing he thought, y'all, she would be here and he'd be judged and get his well done. Are y'all hearing me today? He could have had the testimony of that. I know God is and I know his word. He's never failed me. This is the test I'm going through, and he's never failed me. I can face this hostile world, and I can have calm assurance and a quiet dwelling place because I know God is the one who's going to walk me through this fire, and I'm, I'm going to come out without the smell of smoke on me. He knew God was true to his word. He's already been fed by ravens out there starving. Ravens fed him. Well, I've been fed by some ravens. How about you? 
I can tell you stories and stories and stories and stories and stories. House payment was due. Lot rent was due. Had a mobile home. Light bill was due. Didn't have any food. Car payment was due. Insurance was due. And I didn't have a dime. I didn't have one dime. And I'd go to that mailbox. And I'd find a letter from somebody I didn't even know their name. And I opened up, there'd be a check for $1,000 in there. I knew that was a raven. I knew that was Yahweh cooking for me. Y'all hear me? I was going to name this, Yahweh baked me a cake. Not only that, He knew that there was a cruise of oil that never was depleted and a handful of meal that was constantly and miraculously being renewed. It was, it was perpetual because he stayed upon the Lord. I didn't get a shipment of oil and a shipment of meal, but I get my allotment from Yahweh every day. Give us this day our daily bread. And the woman who obeyed the man of God, he said, look, I'm hungry. She said, I only got enough for me and my son to just live another day. And let me tell you what this preacher did. This greedy, money-grubbing preacher said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You go give, you go fix me a cake first. You hear what I just said? And I know it makes people chew it. You just chew their tongue when they hear that because it don't make sense. Let me tell you what happened. But because she obeyed, even though it didn't make sense, how about it makes sense? Just fix for me first. The average person would think that would be selfish and greedy, but it wasn't. He was releasing to her, giving her opportunity to obey the, the power of faith through obedience. And as long as there was a drought, that cruise of oil never failed. And that meal barrel never went dry. Not only that, but her son got sick. Her son got sick. And he died. I think the King James says, and he quit living. And she, what's the deal? I said, bring him here. Because she had a place for him. She made a room for that prophet. He took the boy upstairs. You know the story. And he got raised from the dead. These are stories that aren't fairy tale stories. But what you can't do and I can't do is say they must not be real just because we haven't been willing to do what God's required of us to do. You hear what he just said? Elijah's seen it, man. He's seen the power of God. All of Israel's showed up to have this great showdown all these false prophets and listen to this only one of him have you ever felt like that before i have it ain't that it's true but has but the truth has nothing to do is when you are ready to Get your eyes off the Lord, and you become selfish and self-centered. And look at yourself. What am I going to do? What am I going to have to do? What am I to be? What about that? I want to tell you what it does. It takes you to a place that Elijah led it. It took him to the same place, as great as he was, and as all the things that he had seen. And he saw a powerful, so great manifested by Yahweh that all those Israelites that were serving and living under the idolatry and worship and that idol of Baal fell on their faces and cried out. And this is what they said. Listen to me. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You know what the Lord means? Yahweh. Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. Why? Because he obeyed God. There wasn't nobody doing it while he was wallowing in his self-pity and getting his eyes on himself. Ain't nobody want to serve God then. Y'all hear what I said? Don't think your children are going to do anything that you're not living. Don't think your friends are going to follow something that they don't see. The 
prophet wrestled. Did you hear what I said? He ran the race. Paul called it wrestling. Because he wanted that deadly drought to stop. And guess what happened? The rain poured in in abundance. Guess what else he did? He outrun royal horses of the wicked king. He said he, he pulled up he, he pulled up his robe and choked him with hill dust. Now, I, I, saw, you know, I was watching a movie one time. Somebody told me to watch this kung fu movie. So I was watching this kung fu movie. I was downstairs, you know, Bevy was upstairs, and she didn't want to see the kung fu movie. So I was downstairs, and I had the light out. And so I'm watching this kung fu movie, and it's got subtitles in English. And they're, hey, you know, you know, they're doing all this. I'm reading it, right, reading it, reading it. And then about 10 minutes into that thing, I'm like, I thought it was a serious kung fu movie. And somebody said, you've got to watch this kung fu movie. And it was, it was the Kung Fu Hustle. How many of you have seen Kung Fu Hustle? Y'all know what it is? It's a comedy. And I looked, I did on the thing, I was like, man, this is in English. So I turned it to English, and this lady has got her curlers on, her, her, her night robe, and she's running real fast. Y'all see her run? That's the picture I get with Elijah. He outrun those horses like that lady did. You, you, let's, let's move on. All of that stuff. Yeah, now we finally, we finally, oh, I got it now. I see the picture. Now, after all of that victory and all those things God did for him and God did through him and he's seen the power of God, a look at the wrong thing and a departure from the path of faith and obedience, say faith and obedience, almost ruined a great man of God. He got his eyes on the wrong thing, and he got off the path of faith and obedience. Faith is the ability to, see, to believe things and do things that you can't see. And obedience is doing it because God said to without any explanation. We call it quickly and quietly. Just obey God quickly and quietly. Well, I don't know if I understand. No, because you're, you're not going to understand it yet. Just obey God if you can't you don't have faith so we need our faith built up I'll tell you what I liked about Elijah one of the things that made me like Elijah the Bible says that he was a man of like passions as we are you know what he just said he has the same passion. He's passionate like we are. He has the same emotional build as we do. He was a man of like passions in the triumphs and the exploits wherein he was blessed by Yahweh. And he was like the man, he was like, he was a man of like passions in the path of discouragement that he pursued. I'm just like him. I've done it. I've been there. I know what it's like. And my going through those things helps me have a heart toward and, and a love for and a patience for and understanding and a long-suffering of other people who are going through it. But I can't keep you from going through it. The fact is, Yahweh calls... And gives his promises to men who have the like passions of Elijah, just like me and you. Am I talking to anybody here? I'm talking to everybody. When he departed that path God marked out for him, this is what that means. We bring ourselves back to the center. We put ourselves back on the throne, so to speak. It's one of the hallmarks of, of discouragement, and this is what it's called. He felt sorry for himself. Self-pity. Poor me. Poor you. Look at what? Poor you. Will you just for a second think back just a little bit of like yesterday? 
What you did yesterday? You mean to tell me that this morning you called fire down from heaven and now you've already got so self-centered you can't see past that? So when we take our own lives in our own hands and when we choose to run away from God's way of doing it, this guy basically took a suicide trip out to the wilderness because he didn't take any provisions with him. And when he, he came from a rough country, and he knew that there was no way, he knew the consequences, that there was no way he was going to be able to survive out there without provisions. So basically he was going out there and saying, I'm just going to die. I think that, it, this is my opinion, I think the Scriptures bears it out, that Elijah didn't have any plan to come back out of that wilderness. He was done. I'm like, how, how can that be? Well, guess what? The same way it can be for me. When I forget all the benefits and all that Yahweh's done from my past, and here it is, because I have a little self-pity or have to go through a little something, guess what we do? We're just ready to say, well, just, well, the King James says, screw it. He got to that tree. He requested to die. He said, it's enough. Take my life. I'm not better any better than my daddy was. I want to tell you what. He said it like this. I'm not better than my father. So when I read that, I want to tell you what. It, it speaks volumes to me. I'm not any better than my daddy was. It, it, it speaks to me about a lot of things. About maybe my attitude about my daddy. I know it's Mother's Day. But I want to tell you what I... What helped me get over my daddy years ago and not hate him? Number one, I found that he wasn't Superman, that he had fears, that he was just a human guy, and that I'm, I'm him now. So if I'm where I'm at in my life and I have knowledge he didn't have and understanding of the things of God, and I'm not boasting in that, it's just the truth, then I wonder how he must have struggled. Yeah, like he knew when it was enough. Okay, that's enough, Johnny, now, or that's enough. God, Elijah didn't know when it was enough. My daddy didn't. He decided for himself that was enough. He, didn't, he don't have the right to say it's enough. You never have the right to say, oh, that's enough. You don't have that right. When we take that right, all of a sudden, we're, no, that's enough. I'm not going to do anymore. Then, guess what? That's just like saying, well, I know when I should die. I'm going to die now. I'm going to make that choice. The most selfish thing that I've seen anybody ever try to do. My dad's favorite scripture was, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. I want to tell you this. It was fortunate that, Yah, that Elijah served the true God. Let me tell you why. Because the true God is a God of love and mercy. I want you to hear me today. Somebody, some people think I'm not merciful. I'm like, you, you, have no, you don't even know me. I've been accused of being too merciful to people. But when I preach, I try to preach as the, as the oracles of God. Representing what Yahweh would say. So who I am here is, is not exactly the same person of how I communicate necessarily every day. Because I can't always say, well, God is good. God loves you all the time. You don't matter what you do. I, you know, I, I can't say that anyhow. But I want to tell you this. Yahweh ain't just a God of triumphs and victories. You hear what I said? He's still God, and he's still my God. When I might cast away my confidence and cave into the pressure, because I've been there. And I love the terminology, cave into the pressure, because that's exactly where he wound up, in a cave. See, what I have learned, though, that no matter if my confidence begins to drift, 
and I become under the influence of fear or, or disappointment or whatever it may be. You got yours, I got mine, but basically they're all the same. Y'all understand that? You ain't no different than me. I ain't no different from you. Your problems ain't no worse than mine. I may have learned how to deal with them after, because I've, I've been in this race longer, and that's why I'm trying to redeem your, your time. But I tell you what I have learned to do. It's my privilege, even in my state of, of whatever it may be and whatever we're calling selfishness, lack of faith, whatever, it's still my privilege to keep on trusting and obeying God even when I don't feel like it or maybe not even believe it at the moment. Anybody here but me? Hello? Yeah. I'm talking about the struggles of a champion. I'm not talking about the struggles of a loser. Y'all hear what I just said? I ain't talking about a loser here. I ain't talking about uh, somebody just a quitter. I'm talking about champions. You can, and I can, and we can, follow Elijah straight down that path to that place. But the fact is, Yahweh is still Yahweh. <laughs> Even when my heart condemns me. Oh, y'all going to get me crying in a minute. When my heart condemns me, John says that God is greater than my heart and knoweth all things. Oh, my God. You may fail, I may fail, but Yahweh never fails. He quit on me. His hand is still on me. I wrote a song about it. You know how it goes? I was born. No. Psalm 103.13. He looked upon his discouraged, exhausted child under that tree. And pitied him. I've learned to let God have pity on me. And not have pity on myself. Can y'all hear me today? I believe you can because I already pray for you. Just kill me. Forget it. Anybody ever done been like that before? I ain't doing that no more. I ain't going to serve God no more. Oh, you need to do this. You need to do that. Blah, blah, blah. You know what? It's like a daddy with his kids. Shut up. Shut up. Whatever. All that self-pity stuff we're talking is really just I'm moving my attention. Yahweh disregarded the foolish prayer of discouragement. Because he knew what he was going through. He knew what it's like. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I think, oh, Elijah needs a break. I think Elijah needs a rest here. Sometimes the blessing of God will wear you out. Because the more you got, the harder it is. You know, I thought, hey, I need to sell my house and get some, you know, downsize and all that. I don't want to move. I don't want to move all that stuff. I'm going to tell you right now, you know what I'm saying? It's like, no, 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 we're going to, we living here forever, honey. I mean, we'll rent the house out and we'll live downstairs or something. But now, now I ain't doing that. Johnny needs, I can tell, I can tell when a child needs to go to sleep. Can you? They get fussy. You just need a nap. I can tell when people have worked hard and hadn't had any sleep. You can tell they're quick. And what? Yahweh sent his angel to his worn out servant. 
I wonder what it was like to feel the angel's touch. I know! I can tell you. I know the touch of that angel when you're wore out and you want to quit. And you're tired and you think you're the only person and you, all of that whiny stuff. And we forget all the great things God did in the past. Well, you didn't do this. Well, my God, was, look at how, look, what? Take our eyes off that. I'll tell you what. I'd be just sleeping spiritually, sometimes physically, naturally, but this discouraged soul perceives and knows that God sends angels to touch you and awaken you from your slumber. I wake up. He wakes me up to the smell of something cooking. Yahweh's done baked me a cake. And he's got a big old glass of milk sitting there waiting on me. Okay, it was manna and water. There is a heavenly provision for me. Do you hear me? When I'm down, when I feel like quitting, when I feel useless, when I have self-pity, when I forget the great things that God has done, and I found out that I just can't, I can't just offend him just because I talk stupid sometimes. Oh, I'm going to drink to that one. I found this out, y'all. Listen. That you can go back for seconds with God. Now, some of y'all got that pretty, down pretty good in the natural. God does it just one time when I fail and I have this issue and I'm, and I'm doing I'm not talking about that I choose to willfully sin and live in it, a lifestyle of it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But I'm going to tell you what. He got a second helping from me. He got another touch from me. He loves me. And he loves you. And he's for us. There is a perspective and loving insight from, from God. And this is what he says. Okay, arise and eat. Because Johnny, I ain't done with you yet. Yeah, but you know how old I am? Yeah, yeah. shut up. Just shut up with your excuses. I'm not finished with you yet. So might as well get up and eat. But knowing that, don't, just, don't heal me of my discouragement. Listen close to me. Elijah wasn't healed of his discouragement after that. He didn't start down this path of discouragement because God led him down there. And he didn't go down that blessed. Listen, he didn't go down that path of discouragement because God wasn't blessing him. You hear me? He didn't say, well, God ain't blessing me. Ain't nobody can talk about God not blessing them. Come on. And God's blessing was incapable of taking away my discouragement. Y'all hear what I'm talking about right now? Can y'all hear what I just said? Even the blessing of God, all the powerful things of my past and the blessing of God wasn't able to take away my discouragement. I, 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 I want to make sure y'all got that. Well, I tell you, if God just blessed me, I'll get a nicer house, I'll get this. And if, if he'll just do this for me, I'm, no, that ain't going to, that will not take it away. And this is a mystery, I think that baffle people in their minds and in their hearts. They keep on and keep on begging God, Lord, just have mercy on me, Lord, you know. Lord, just heal me. Lord, just revive me. Let 
we got to come to grips with the fact that we're discouraged because we've chosen to be. I mean, I'm not making a fly in the face of people, but I'm telling you, it ain't because God hadn't done his part. I guarantee that. God ain't going to operate your will for you. God ain't going to force you to eat your peas. God ain't going to, he ain't going to do that. That's your job. I found out, oh, that's my job. But I found this out too. But if I ask him to help me, he will. All right, here we go, Lord. I'm going to do it. So what would Elijah do now after receiving this impartation of strength? He went further down the path of discouragement. He went, miraculously, by the way, 40 days and 40 nights down the path of his choosing, and he ended up at Mount Horeb, or which is Mount Sinai, or which is called the Mount of God. But as most people do on their own, they go back to who they were before. That's good preaching right there. We go back to our strengths. That's, who do we used to be? That's who I'm going to be now. I'm just going to go back to where I was. That's what he did. Even after God made provision for him, God woke him up, cooked him breakfast. Blessed him. Watch this. He went to a darn cave. He went to a cave. Y'all hear me? And that's what we do. We go get in our cave, our man cave. We get in isolation. We go to that cave, and that's where we decide we're going to live. The fact is, he should have been dead already. I mean, he was in the wilderness. God provided for him. You know, he lived 40 days and 40 nights. There's no way. That journey, the journey to make it to where they get to, they, it's too great. But God made it possible for him to travel over a month in the wilderness to the place where the truth had been given. Where? Mount Sinai. A bunch of people made that trip. We should be over here in the promised land, but we are going around the mountain again. Many discouraged people have made the torturous pilgrimage back to their starting place. Instead of growing through it, besides of, of having and using what God's given to us, we go to that cave. How did we get there, man? Did I miss something from the start here? Did I, did I, what, what? It's like the two people on the road to Emmaus. This is what they said. They were so discouraged. They said, but we trusted that it had been he which would have redeemed Israel. We just wish that was true. We just wish that was him. We just wish he was going to be the one to do it. You know what they missed? They missed the whole gospel. It was him, but he wasn't going to do it at that time. So a misunderstanding of, of the purpose of God. So I know that we have the potential to go back to where we were, crawl into a cave, and stay there. Even though Yahweh will still speak to you in that cave. Yahweh ain't going to leave you to brood and pile and wine and all that in that cave. Listen to this. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, Elijah, what are you doing here? Or King James, what doest thou here, Elijah? I think it's a good question. What are you doing here? What? What are you doing here? The Bible says the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. What does that mean? Yahweh knows what's wrong. 
He knew what was wrong. He knew that the key to solution was in Elijah's willingness to take action and start doing the right things, even if he didn't feel like it. Many times I haven't felt like doing stuff. I don't feel like it. I had to quit choosing the direction of discouragement that I've been choosing that got me into the place of that cave to start with. Do you know that he could have not gone through the wilderness? He, he didn't have to go to Mount Horeb. He didn't have to go to that cave. He could have turned around and gone right back to Israel in the strength of that angelic food that God had given him and empowered him, but no. Just like when Ananias came to Saul and said, Hey, why are you doing what are you doing here now? Didn't God tell you to go to the wilderness? Go. How about Joshua? He just got defeated at Ai because of tithing and not tithing and robbing and stealing from God. And he began to, to have this gloomy vision of what's going to happen tomorrow. And this is what Yahweh said. Up! Up! Have you told a kid that? Up! Sanctify the people and say sanctify yourselves against tomorrow i want to tell you there's a time to sit still and know that he is god i've heard it I'm, i want to understand that but that ain't the that ain't the word you need to give somebody who's discouraged well he, just be still and know that i'm god people get in they proceed in this path by their own efforts and i'll tell you what you got to exert yourself in the name of yahweh and get out of that path I'm not staying here. What am I doing? It's like the prodigal son. I can eat better as a servant of my father than eating with these pigs. Excuse me. The pigs didn't even eat with him. He ate their leftovers. When Yahweh asked the depressed man of God, Elijah, what are you doing there? All that bitterness, all the self-centeredness, all the the disconnect between the promises of God and the people of God. All the hopelessness of the prophet bleah, came out. This is what he said. I've been very jealous for the, for the Lord of hosts. Listen close. Let me tell you what that means. I've been very jealous. Hey, I've eagerly served you. That's what the word means in Hebrew. Man, I've served you, God. I'm Elijah. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and the slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am only one left and seek my life. To, and they seek my life to take it away. Okay, here we go. Here we go. He let the cat out of the bag. Are y'all with me? Can I finish this today? I'm going to tell you, he let the cat out of the bag. What did he say? Because I did this and I did that. And, and now look at me. Now, you know why I'm saying it, why I say it that way? Because it's pathetic. We as men and women of God should not be looking at what others don't do or does or whatever. I've served you, but what about that? What about this? Look, he's got that. What's that? There? Listen, I know it well. You ain't telling me nothing. I know this place well, but I also know how to get out. I ain't, I ain't staying there. I know how to get out. So I'm looking for some kind of faith in here that, his, that he's speaking to Yahweh. I've been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel, forsaken thy covenant, thrown down the altars, slain thy prophets with sword, and I, even I, only am left. And you know what? I'm the only person here that knows the truth and is serving God. Every, all of y'all are wrong. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You're not as good as me. You're not as good as me. I do it right, and everything you do is wrong. And below me, you have disappointed me. You fail me, people. Y'all hear me? Now, we have those feelings. That's why the body is so disjointed because we're like eh, you didn't look at me right you didn't say this right you didn't know you didn't do this blah 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 you ain't gonna find faith in his answer all you find is a whiny 
pouty prophet who got his eyes off of Yahweh and his eyes off of the reward. Discouragement is utterly fatal to faith. Y'all hear me? You can't have faith while you're discouraged. But I like this about Yahweh. He didn't argue with him. Some people like to argue. I don't like to argue no more. <laughs> Do you? No arguing for me. Matter of fact, if you're going to argue, go home to do it. I don't want even see argument. Matter of fact, when people argue in front of me now, I say, "Hey, stop, stop! I, I can't, I can't be hearing that." No, you go over there. Y'all go home to argue. But I, I'm not going to hear people yelling and screaming at each other to make my blood pressure go up anymore. God didn't argue with him, but what he did do is set up a demonstration of what he could do. But the important part of that demonstration was not what God could do, but whether or not the prophet would be willing to get off this own path and follow the way Yahweh says do it. You know, it's that simple. You're either going to do it Yahweh's way, Yah's way or the highway, basically, is what they say. So this is what God said. Go and stand upon that mountain for the Lord. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can climb that mountain or not. That's too high for me. I'm scared of heights. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't make sense to me. Why would I do that? It's raining outside. Blah, 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 blah. Go and get up on that mountain. Guess what Elijah did? He just quickly and quietly did it. Then try to figure out, I can't afford this. It don't work in my plan. It don't work in my, yeah, let's say, my budget don't work there. I have my time frame. I can't do it. I blah, 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 person. I mean, he just did it. You know how he knew to do it? Because that's how he started his walk. And that's how he finished his walk. Just go do that. Anoint him. Anoint him. Get him. Call him. He'll do that. Just do it. Well, I don't know. You don't, you're not as smart as God. I'm not as smart as God. Listen, and can I tell you this? You ain't got to be feeling it to obey Him. Because a lot of things God tells me to do, I ain't feeling it. And that don't mean I don't have to say, hey, okay, let me see here now. I've learned to quickly and to quietly just do it. We can obey without much more faith than it takes just to do what we know God wants us to do. The Bible says do it. Just do it. That's all the faith you need right now. It's that simple. This was the first step to the reversal of a mindset of discouragement. That still small voice came. And with it came recognition and remembrance in the heart of the man of God. Now he's talking to me again. He's talking to me. It was something else to look at than that which he's been looking at the whole time since he took that detour that cast his confidence away from God. And again, relentlessly, Yahweh said, Hey! What are you doing here, boy? And then another outburst of self-pity, but I expect that it didn't have exactly the same tone as before. I believe it was kind of weakening. Because now you're beginning to see, well, you know, God wasn't that bad to me, or God does, He really does, and it really does work, and I really, you know. He laid out a path of obedience and trust to Him. He said, look, this is my will for you, so to speak. He said, and the last what he said, he gave this rebuke to him, though. Let me tell you something, Mr. Smarty Pants. Now, I don't know what version that is, but I found it somewhere. 
Mr. You're the only one that has served God. And Mr. and Mrs., you don't, oh, you don't get, you, you haven't, I haven't blessed you. And oh, Mr., you're discouraged because you got your eyes on. Listen, I've been there. Somebody said, well, who else is preaching this stuff? Well, a lot of people preach what I'm preaching today. But there's other things that cause me to be isolated, withdrawn, blah, all the different things we've talked about this morning. But listen to what Yahweh told him. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Can I tell you something? Everything you're going through today, we all go through. And that's why I come to church should be so important. So when I'm in my place, you can be, say, I've already been there. Hey, wrong, wrong way, wrong way. Come on. Whoa, let's get you over here. Let's move you over here. Let's encourage one another. Let's strengthen one another. Just like God's rebukes are profound. It gave Elijah a lot to think about. That if, if I'm anything like Elijah at all, all of these things in my life gave me food for thought and has been with me for the rest of my life. I've learned not to take that path. I've learned certain things through this process. Obadiah is talking about, hey, I've got, I've got, this is in chapter uh, let's see, eight, seven, 17, I think. Obadiah says that I got hundreds of prophets that I've hidden in caves. And they didn't bow down. And in other words, this is what God says. Oh, listen to me. There's no foundation for me to be discouraged. You hear me? There is no reason for me to be discouraged serving God. Serving God, there's no reason for me to be discouraged. I want to tell you what, it's been nothing but great for me since I've served God. That don't mean that life hadn't been bad to me and all that, but he delivered me out of them all. I want to tell you, I've gone through hard times too. We've had losses and all these kind of things in our lives, but the fact is, there is no foundation for discouragement. And there never is and never will be when you serve Yahweh. Could Elijah take courage in not taking that path and that trip? Yes. Were there grounds for him to take courage and deal with that thing of saying, I'm the only one left to look at me, what I've done, and you haven't done, and me, me, me? Yes. He could have said, Yahweh, encourage me. He could have said, Johnny, encourage me. He could have said, Ecclesia, encourage me. He could have said, spouse, encourage me. He could have said, daddy, encourage me. Or he could have been like David and just encourage yourself in the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7. I want you to put that up there. I'm closing with this. I promise. I've got about an hour left. Y'all read that right now. Read it. Read it to yourself. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you say it with emphasis just say say it with the, the emphasis like we used to do you know casting all your care casting all your care casting all your care casting all your care upon casting all care upon him i can preach that just that whole thing would be longer than my message today we have to learn to trust and obey Yahweh. Like the old song, we say, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Yahshua is to trust and obey. Now look at me. Y'all read it? If we're going to walk in victory, we dare not retain one single care. We can't retain. He says it. Casting all your care. All our care must be given to Yahweh. If you don't cast your care on Him and let Him care for you, then you will hinder. You will hinder the ability that you have to completely trust and obey Him. To realize that Yahweh is the one that determines the end result for those that love Him and are called according to His purpose is the place 
of quiet, peaceable habitations. And I want to tell you what, that ain't what country you live in as much as it's what's in your and my head. To trust and obey is the only way to have faith in what God says and to do it even if you don't understand it at the time is the only way that you're going to avoid the path that Elijah went on and the only way we will be able to escape the way of discouragement. God bless y'all. Can you